Hello everyone, it's time to do some test review. So, we're going to wrap up this whole unit. I'll show you everything that we have gone over. A couple problems of everything. If you can do this, it should be in pretty good shape for your test. So the first thing we talked about was just converting angles. If you're starting in degrees, then you want to, uh, the way I kind of think about this is we're canceling degrees. Think of it as dimensional analysis. Pi radians in 180 degrees so you can cancel out degrees. Now when you do this, the easiest thing to do to keep your answer in terms of pi is you're just reducing a fraction. If I do 135 over 180 and I don't include the pi, and I can have my calculator do it for me. I mean, it's 3 fourths, it's not a big deal. That's 3 pi over 4. So this is 3 pi over 4. I mean, that's on a unit circle. You probably didn't need to convert it. Pi over 180. So if I do negative 50 divided by 180. Let's see, that's 5 over 18, negative 5 pi over 18. So yeah, you don't really need a calculator for that because, you know, we're talking about 5 pi over 18. That fraction is easy to reduce. Uh, now, if you're going the other way, so negative pi over 12, then you're going to try and cancel out the radians. So you'll multiply by 180 over pi. Now, these are going to be decimals. When you're going to degrees, you're not going to get nice numbers. You've got pi in the mix but you'll notice that pi cancels out if you have if it's in terms of pi so that's nice we'll do negative 180 this might be nice and we get negative 15 so we don't even have it it's negative 15 degrees pi over 12 15 degrees same thing here we're going to multiply by 180 over pi and then we'll say look the pi's cancel out so it's 14 times 180 and then we'll divide by 15 we get 168, so this is 168 degrees. So these are nice and friendly degrees. Most of the time we've done these, the degrees have been decimals. But who cares? It's great. They're nice. All right, let's try something else. Find the arc length and area of a sector. So you'll notice on here I did give you the formulas. You should have these formulas memorized. I should not need to give you these formulas. But it says uh, find the arc length and area of a sector. So the formulas are 1 half theta r squared, and the arc length is s equals r theta. So if I want to find the area, I need to know the radius and I need to know theta. We got the radius and we got theta. So what's going to happen is somebody's going to go, this is so easy, uh, 25 and then 18 squared. And I'm like, you obviously know how to plug things in, but you do not realize that this formula only works if your angle is in radians. It's in degrees. So this is not going to work. You can... Do, you can do the conversion if you want right here. Just multiply by pi over 180. So pi over 180, and then the radius is 18. But you need to convert the degrees into radians. So we're going to multiply by pi over 180, and that'll cancel out the degrees. So I'll just type this all my calculator. It's going to be messy. That's fine. It's going to be 1 half. Oops. I'll do point. Five. My theta is 25 degrees, and i got to multiply by pi over 180 to convert it to radians. And then I'm going to multiply that by 18, which is going to get squared. So the area is 70.69. Uh, and we'll say that's, do we have units meters squared? So the area is 70.69. 9 meters squared. It says hundreds, so that's two decimal places, 70.69. Now for the arc length, S equals the radius is 18, and theta is 25. And again, you need to convert it into radians. So we'll multiply by pi over 180. So then it's just calculator work. 18 times 25 pi over 180. Oop, that's not over. Oh, no. Over 180. And that means your arc length is 7.85. S equals 7.85. And arc length, that's a length. So 7.85 meters. What we just found, if you draw a picture, the two things that we just found are, oh, that's not right. Here's my arc. This is part of a circle. We know the radius is 18, and we know theta was 25 degrees. So we found the area of the sector. We found this. That's 70.69. And then we found the length of the arc. The length of the arc is a fraction of the circumference. That was 7.85. So the area was 70.69, and the arc length was 7.85. Cool. Uh, now we got a little bit of right triangle trig. 
It says you're standing 100 meters from the main entrance to the Sears Tower. They might call it the Willis Tower, but I'll never call it anything but the Sears Tower. Uh, so what do we got? It says you are 100 meters from the main entrance. So we're 100 meters away. And it says the angle of elevation is 77 degrees. So angle of elevation is always from the horizontal. You're looking up. So this is 77 degrees. And we're trying to figure out the height of the tower. So what we need to decide is what is the best, most appropriate trig function here. <clears throat> from 77 degrees, we have H, which is opposite. And we have 100, which is adjacent. So opposite over adjacent, we're going to say the tangent of 77 is H over 100. So to solve that, you would multiply both sides by 100. So 100 times the tangent of 77. Make sure your calculator is in degrees. 433.15. H is 433.15. 433 meters. About like 1,500 feet. Sounds reasonable. Okay. Suppose one of your friends at the top of the Sears Tower. What is a straight line distance? So now we're saying basically find a different thing. We're trying to figure out how far they are straight line distance. So this is the distance we're trying to find. Now, you could do Pythagorean theorem. You could take that squared plus 100 squared. Oop, that's not squared. Uh, try again. Squared. Oh, jeez. There. Okay. And square root it. So one way you could do this, if you already found h, is you could say, hey, they're 444 uh, by doing Pythagorean theorem. Or... You could use trig again, adjacent over hypotenuse. So adjacent would be the cosine of 77 is 100 divided by D. You just got to realize that when the variable is in the denominator, you're going to divide 100 divided by the cosine of 77. But look, you get the same exact answer. doesn't matter how you do it. Hypotenuse is still a hypotenuse. And it's 444, oops, 444, 444 meters. So 444 meters diagonally. Now, just imagine for a second that you got an answer that was smaller than 433. You know you did it wrong. The hypotenuse has to be the longest side. So if you get something here that is shorter than what you thought the tower was, you know you did it wrong. Just pay attention to that. It's an easy little check. It keeps you out of trouble. All right, let's do some more right triangle trig. It says you're standing on the Eiffel Tower at Kings Island. So let's see, there's the Eiffel Tower. And you look down at your friend in angle depression. Okay, so let's do this guy. Here's my Eiffel Tower. And we're saying that's 300 feet tall. And it says you look down and the angle depression changes from 65 to 78. So angle of depression is not that. Angle of depression is you always draw from a horizontal. So if you're at the top of the Eiffel Tower, you look out. From a horizontal. This is the angle of depression. It changes from 65 to 78. So 65 right here, these are alternate interior angles. Okay, you have a horizontal that's parallel to the ground. If I'm looking out horizontal from the tower and you're looking out horizontal on the ground, we're looking at each other at the same angle. And that angle is 65 degrees. Those are alternate interior angles. But as you get closer, the angle changes. So the angle changes from 65 degrees to 78 degrees. So I'm going to say this is 78 degrees. Now that's this angle. Those are alternate interior angles there. So if you kind of like to help see it, if I, can I take this guy and get out of there? Yeah, look, that's 78. And then the other one's 78. So we change from 65 to 78. It should make sense that as you get closer to the tower, the angle of elevation goes up. If you're like right in front of it, you're looking almost straight up. So as you get closer, make sure that it's drawn in a way where the angle is smaller the further away you are. We're trying to find how far they traveled. So that's this. Uh, we'll just call that guy Y. So I can find Y very easily. And I really need to figure out two things. I need to figure out X plus Y and Y. And then I'll be able to find X. So let's find Y. The tangent of 78 is 300 divided by Y. So... To, to solve that, you do 300 divided by the tangent. So 300 divided by the tangent of 78. And we get 63.77. I'm not going to actually round, except for just kind of to, to label these things. So that means at first, these are feet, right? This is 63 feet away. The second time we see them, they're 63 feet away. But we don't know where they are where they start. 
but I can figure out their total distance away pretty easily. I can say the tangent of 65 is 300 over, and then this is x plus y, which I know what y is, so I'll eventually end up subtracting. So x plus y is 300 divided by the tangent of 65, which is 139.89. 139.89. So to illustrate what I know, I'm going to kind of label this and say, I know that this distance is 139, and I know that this distance is 63. So if I want to figure out the distance that they traveled, which is my unknown, I'm just going to subtract. So I'm going to take this guy, the 139, and subtract the 63. And notice, I'm not rounding. I'm keeping all my decimals. I think it's 76.13 if we're going to the nearest hundredth. So that means x is 73.13. Okay, we're trying to we're trying to, or 76. I don't know why I said 73. 76.13. And that is feet. So you walk 73 feet, now you're 63 feet away. 76 feet. But the main thing here is that you're able to solve two right triangles. Nothing too fancy. What else do you got? Uh, wheel of machine. Okay, so we're going to do angular and linear speed. So the first thing you need to remember that angular speed, the formula for angular speed is theta over time. We use W usually. So theta, they're giving you theta if they're telling you 300 RPMs. So if you go around 300 revolutions, so 300 revolutions per minute, and each revolution is 2 pi radians, then you just multiply and you get 600 pi radians per, do they give me, do they care what units it is? No, radians per, I'll just say one minute. So the angular speed is 600 pi radians a minute. Leave that one in terms of pi. When it says exact answer, exact means in terms of pi. We're not rounding, I don't want any decimals. 600 pi radians a minute is the answer. For linear speed, you just take the angular speed and you multiply by the radius. So the only thing we need to know is the radius. We already know the radius. The diameter is 80, so the radius is 40. Theta is still 600 pi, and we're still doing this for one minute. But now our units are no longer radians, they are centimeters. So this is centimeters per minute. So if I take 40 times 600 pi, I will get 70, uh, I'm sorry, um, centimeters per minute. So let's do that and we'll see what that is. And then maybe we'll convert it just to kind of practice because you'll probably have to do some dimensional analysis. 40 times 600 pi is 75,398.22. So that's 75398.2. That's centimeters per minute. Just for practice, I'm going to convert that. Let's Normally, I'll tell you what I want your units to be in. So let's say I wanted that in meters per second. So if I wanted that in meters per second, I'm going to do some dimensional analysis. Uh, 40 times 600 pi. And right now, that's per one minute. Ooh, one minute. So if we're in centimeters per minute and I want to convert it, first thing I'll do is say that there are 100 centimeters in one meter. And that cancels those out. So now my answer would be meters per minute. And if I want meters per second, then I'll say one minute, that'll cancel out minutes, is 60 seconds. So now I have meters per second. So if I take that answer that I had before and divide by 100 times 60, I'll be good. Divide by, just make sure that you do 100 times 60 in the denominator, so use parentheses. You get 12.57. So meters per second will be 12.57. 12.57, okay. 75,000 centimeters a minute or 12.57 meters per second. I will tell you what I want your answer to be in as far as units are concerned. You just need to be able to do a little bit of dimensional analysis to convert it. All right, solve equations and notice the directions. The directions say between zero and two pi. So there's no like pi n stuff. This is just saying if you go around once, where will your answers be? Um, and there's two things that I know my giveaway is about factoring. First one is if I see two different trig functions, I know I'm going to have to factor. And if I see two different degrees, a quadratic and a linear term, I know I'm going to have to factor. So both of these are factor problems. 
So what I'm going to do is look for the GCF. The GCF is the sine of x. And if I factor out a sine of x, I will have cosine of x minus 1. If you distribute, you kind of check this. Sine times cosine is sine times cosine. And sine times negative 1 is sine. So now I need to use the zero product property. Either this factor is zero or that factor is zero. Either the sine of x is zero or cosine of x minus 1 is zero, which means the cosine of x is 1. Add 1 to both sides. Who's got to figure out where this happens? Where is sine zero? Sine is the y value. So sine is zero on the x-axis right here and right there. So that's at zero and pi. And cosine is one also right there. Look, this is cosine is, is the x, that's one, and sine is zero. So this is like a double count. Like this doesn't add anything that we didn't already know. So x equals either zero or pi radians. Zero or pi. Uh, for number 10, if you see that you have sine squared and you have sine of x, I like to do a u substitution here to kind of help make this easier to see. So I'll say that u is the sine of x. And now I'm factoring. This is just split the middle. So find numbers that multiply to 4 and add to negative 5. Numbers that multiply to 4 and add to negative 5 would be uh, negative 4 and negative 1. And then we do factor by grouping to u, u minus 2, minus 1, u minus 2. Uh, 2u minus 1, u minus 2. If you are not able to factor a trinomial, you are in very bad shape. u equals 1 half, u equals 2. So that is the sine of x. The sine of x is 1 half, and the sine of x is 2. We just got to figure out where that happens. So the sine of x is positive 1 half. Well, sine's positive in the first and second quadrant, and if the leg is one half, that means the angle of reference is 30 degrees. Where is sine of x2? It ain't. The biggest sine will ever be is right there. The biggest sine can be is 1. Sine will never be 2, so that doesn't really help us. So the two angles are the 30 degree reference angles, which would be pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6 in the first and second quadrant. Notice again, it says between 0 and 2 pi, so we're just going to say positive angles that are not all the way around. You don't need to worry about 2 pi. So it's got to be between 0 and 2 pi for your answers, the way these directions are written. Uh, but I might say find all solutions, like in these problems. So for all solutions, now we're going to have to worry about the pi n stuff. So you'll notice that this is only cosecant squared. I'm not going to have to factor this. I'm going to say cosecant squared x equals add 4 divided by 3, 4 thirds. You know, like the cosecant, well, I'm better with sine. So the reciprocal of cosecant is sine. The reciprocal of 4 thirds is 3 fourths. Then you square root both sides, and you remember plus and minus, because if you ever square root both sides, you got to do plus and minus. The square root of 3 is the square root of 3. The square root of 4 is 2. And now we just got to figure out where this happens. So when I draw this, sine is plus or minus radical 3 over 2. I think that's all the 60s. Yeah. So these are all the 60 degree reference angles. If the long leg is radical 3 over 2, if the y is radical 3 over 2, then that means there's 60 degree reference angles. And since it's plus or minus, it's all of them. So I'm going to list this out as pi over 3 plus, this is pi over 3. And since these are 180 across, I'll say plus pi n. And then the other angle, I'll start at 2 pi over 3, and I'll add pi n from there. These are all solutions, so these do have the pi n stuff. Number 12 looks messy. You see that there's different degrees, 3, 2, and 1. So let's maybe make this, let's do a u substitution here and see if it helps. All right, if it's got four terms, it's like they already split the middle for us. So we're just going to factor by grouping. 3u squared, u minus 1, minus 1, u minus 1. So this is factor by grouping. Find the GCF of the two halves. We just did that. So I have 3u squared minus 1 and u minus 1 as my factors. So either u squared is 1 third or u is 1. 1 third, that'd be, if you square root that, the square root of 1 is 1 and the square root of 3 is a radical 3. So holy cow. All right. So either u, which is, I'll just change it back, either the tangent of x is radical 3 over 3, or the 
the tangent of x is 1. And this is plus or minus, so it's all of them. So where does that happen? Let's see. The tangent of x is radical 3 over 3. You just need to remember that the tangent of 60 is radical 3, and the tangent of 30 is radical 3 over 3. So when you see this, plus and minus, that's all of the 30 degree reference angles. So all four quadrants. And the last thing is tangent is 1. So tangent is 1, like these are the 30s. Tangent is 1 when x and y are the same. So that would be the 45 degree reference angles, but it's positive and only the first and third quadrant. So this looks really weird. Let's see if we can list all these out. We'll say x equals pi over 6 plus, I'll pick this guy up, pi n. So there's those two. 5 pi over 6 plus pi n. 5 pi over 6 plus pi n, that's over here. And then the last one will be pi over 4, because it's a 45 degree reference angle, plus pi n. Pi over 4 plus pi n puts you down there. So that is all your solutions. Kind of a weird looking graph, but that's cool. Anytime you're dealing with these factoring problems, you can get slightly asymmetrical looking graphs. A couple more. This says the tangent of x is negative 1 over radical 3, because if you subtract 1 and divide by radical 3, then we don't need to square root it, but we do need to rationalize it. So this is negative radical 3 over 3. So it's the same thing as before. The tangent of 30 is radical 3 over 3. So that means we're dealing with 30 degree reference angles. And tangent is negative in the second and fourth quadrant when x and y are different, opposite signs. So the way we'll say that is 5 pi over 6 plus pi n. 5 pi over 6 starts over in the second quadrant. And if you add pi n, then you pick up this guy in the fourth quadrant. So here's 5 pi over 6, add pi n, that's that one. One more. I know I'm going to have to uh, factor because I have two different degrees. So I'll say u minus 2u squared. And then I'll do GCF is u. And that's u minus, or no, no, it's 1 minus 2u when you do GCF. So either u, which is the cosine of x, is 0, or 1 minus the 2, well, let's solve that one. Uh, 1 minus 2u is 0, which means 1 equals 2u, which means u equals 1 half, which is the cosine is 1 half. So I'm just solving a linear equation here. Um, the cosine is 1 half, or the cosine is 0. Where does that happen? Let's see, cosine is 0. So the x is 0, that's on the y-axis. So that happens two places, right there and right there. Or cosine is 1 half. So cosine is 1 half, the x is the short leg. If this is 1 half, then the long leg is radical 3 over 2, which helps you find the reference angle of 60 degrees. And cosine is positive in the first and fourth quadrants. So again, we get this kind of funky looking shape. We'll say that x equals, how about we say pi over 2, that's right here, and I'll say plus pi n, that gets that, those two, and then I'll say pi over 3, that's right here, and I'm going to write this as two different statements, so plus 2 pi n, or 5 pi over 3 plus 2 pi n. So if you say pi over 3 plus pi n, 1 pi, you'd be down here, and that's not an answer, so you can't say 1 pi n, but if you say 2 pi n, that means go all the way around, and that's fine. And then down here, plus 2 pi n as well. The, uh, the fancy way of condensing those two would be to say plus or minus pi over 3. And you still need to add 2 pi n for the same reason I said before. So either of these are okay. I don't care which one you put. But you should be able to get this one no problem. And then either of those works. So that's solving. Is there anything else on here? A little bit inverse trig. Okay, so inverse trig, you just got to be a little careful. There's a couple things. First of all, if it says inverse cosine, what you need to remember is inverse cosine has a restricted range. We are only going to get answers from the top. So you don't need to worry about the third or fourth quadrant. And if cosine is negative radical 3 over 2, then the x is negative radical 3 over 2, which means the y is 1 half, which means we're dealing with a 30 degree reference angle. So in the second quadrant, 30 degree reference angle, that would be... I mean, you don't really need to say x. We're just going to say it equals 5 pi over 6. 
So we're figuring out that the reference angle is 30 degrees, and now I want the answer in radians, 5 pi over 6. So this is an inverse trig function, and they're saying that the inverse tangent of radical 3, I know that the inverse tangent of radical 3 is 60 degrees, which I'll say is pi over 3. That I can evaluate. So what I'm really asking you to find is the cosine of pi over 3. Pi over 3 is in the first quadrant, right there. Okay, the 60 degree reference angle, pi over 3 radians. So the cosine is the x. The x would be 1 half, so this equals 1 half. Now last one, 3 eighths is not on the unit circle, so I'm going to draw a helper triangle. And when I draw it, I know I have to come from the first or second. Cosine is positive in the first. Let's draw a triangle. So the cosine of some angle, this is inverse, uh, let me show you, 3 over 8 equals theta. The inverse cosine of a ratio is an angle. And the way you might think about that is, that means that the cosine of some angle is 3 over uh, 8. That's an 8, 3 over 8. These are inverse functions. So inverse functions flip the input and the output. They just get flipped. So by saying the inverse cosine of 3 8, what I'm really saying is there is some angle whose cosine is 3 8. So cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. And now I just need to do <clears throat> Pythagorean theorem. So 3 squared plus y squared is 8 squared. So that's 64 minus 9. So y squared is 55. So we'll say this is radical 55. So I'm just building this little helper triangle. And now they're saying, find the sine of that angle. The sine of theta is opposite over hypotenuse. So this would be radical 55 over 8. And when you get these crazy ones, you can check this with your calculator. It's not going to do the work for you, but you can check it. The sine of the inverse cosine of 3 eighths. And I think that it should be radical 55 over 8. But maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. Hey, I do know what I'm talking about. We nailed it. All right. So that's it for your trig functions. If you guys can do all that, you are in good shape. You got a lot you can be reviewing. So go through, make sure you have everything finished for the unit. Hit that like and subscribe button and good luck.